in the saddle. What's up? What's happening? I wish I could say I felt super refreshed after my time off. Honest to God, I feel exhausted today. But we're going to make it through. Four o'clock here on the Team 980. Happy to be with you. And, uh, yeah, Anthony, I'm I'm back. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to be back. Uh, I got my butt kicked in a workout class this morning, and I just haven't. I haven't felt uh, alive all day since then. So that's that's a thousand percent my fault. But we're gonna it's game time now. I'm gonna I'm gonna get back into it and I'm ready to go. I'm fired up because we have the end of the wizard season to talk about. We also have uh, some interesting comments around some of the reporting with Dan Snyder uh, and where he and Jeff Bezos's relationship is or isn't. Uh, we have some other stuff coming up, but I want to just dive right in on on the process of what happened uh, this season to the Wizards and where they are. 35 wins. Tommy Shepard says, I am disgusted uh, with it. Uh, we'll have more audio, hopefully, as the day goes. We got a bunch of quotes, but uh, we're, we're waiting on the actual audio. Uh, and, and I want to be able to play it in full for you. But w- Shepard did say, and the day after, by the way, he said, uh, oh, we're, we're incomplete, he told Wes Hall before the game yesterday. Today, he's like, no, I'm disgusted with 35 wins. Um, just a, a disappointing season. Uh, to say the least, um, a frustrating season. And I think the thing that um, I don't want to lose sight of here uh, before we play you some of the audio from Wes Unseld yesterday is the Wizards finished with 35 wins in a season where Vegas had them at 35 and a half. They, in their uh, franchise management down the stretch, locked up being or hitting the under. Wizards betters is, you know, last week we're like, we're good if we have the over. We're barely going to get there. This should have been a lot easier, but we're going to be fine. Sure enough, they hit that under. So this is not a team that underachieved by the best metric that we have, the the Vegas win loss. I mean, I don't. They don't air condition the desert because they lose. They they know what they're doing out there, and the fact that they had this team, even though people like me and I think I know basketball pretty well and I know this team pretty well, I thought they were going to be floating probably closer to forty wins. I would have definitely taken the over on thirty five. Would have said, hey, you know, maybe they, they they get some bad health luck, fine. But to be this bad, it's exactly what Vegas thought it would be. And they get that, by the way, with Kristaps Porzingis having arguably the best season of his career and playing more games than he has in a long, long time. So that's why this, this comment from Wes Unsell Jr. kind of confused me yesterday post-game. And I guess let's just go ahead and play it with that, with that introduction. This... This confused me a little bit. Um, just kind of the mindset of, you know, we're, we're not where we want to be. And certainly no one should be, you know, happy with the, the results, you know, how this season played out. But you know, there's still a lot of positives. And, you know, I think sometimes we get caught up, um, you know, everything's about results and we lose sight of process. And so I think it's important to also embrace some of that um, and understand that, you know, some of the failures when – and that's part of success. You have to kind of go through that sometimes. So they're not, you know, completely separate. I think those failures, those become lessons, you know, and well, we've learned a lot of lessons and now we have to figure out how to, you know, um, take some steps forward. But I'm proud of the effort. I'm proud of the you know, the fact that we were able to go through some things this year and show a ton of resilience, you know, to, to keep playing and competing together. Uh, that's something I think you can be proud of. I don't have a problem with most of what Wes Unseld actually said there. I would just like to underscore the process thoughts. Um, Yes, this team did not snipe at each other and want to kill each other in the way that last year's team did. They certainly had some young guys like Jordan Goodwin, incredible story, steps up, uh, is is probably a a rotational piece for them back end of the bench, but a a piece you can rely on in that role in the future. Um, I do think Denny Obvious showed some growth. Corey Kispert showed pretty significant growth, turned himself into one of the best three-point shooters in the league and is a guy that I think they can rely on to carry a nice scoring clip moving forward, a guy they're going to have to get shots for because his three-point percentage demands it. If he can get better on the defensive end of the floor, then he becomes a really valuable piece because he becomes a 3 and D guy, which is the most valuable thing a role player can be in the 2020s NBA. Um, 
Beal had the most efficient season of his career. Porzingis had arguably the best season of his career, certainly since his second year in New York, his, his all-star year. Kuzma, career high in points. Like, There's a lot of things that would be considered positives. What I don't understand is how that is a process and that is good because they finished the exact same 35 and 47 that they did last year, which is one game better than the 34 and 38 that they finished in 2020 and the 25 and 47 record uh, in, in 1920 was obviously very bad. Uh, I should be noted the 34 and 38 record, obviously a shortened season uh, in, in 2020, 2021, they made the playoffs and lost in the first round. That was the Westbrook year. It's not good. They're not on the right track. There's no, there's no spinning this. The last time they had a season that finished over 500 was 2017, 2018. They lost in the, the first round of the playoffs. The year before that, Scott Brooks' first year is the closest they've been to 50 wins since the last time they had it, which was, what, 1978, 1979, I think? Uh, or, sorry, the 74-75 Bullets uh, had 60 wins, and I think that was the last one. Yeah. So, uh, hmm. Not great. That was the first year of the Washington Bullets, by the way. They were the Capitol Bullets the year before and the Baltimore Bullets before that. Like, they've never had a coach go the right direction in recent memory. Brooks, his first year with the team was that 49-win team. And it's 43, 32, 25, and fired. Randy Whitman, 44 to 46 to 41. Gone. Uh, Obviously, Flip's tenure was uh, not very good here. Uh, Eddie Jordan didn't really have a, a peak. Uh, he, he was kind of arguably Eddie Jordan's the best coach they've had in the last, since like 2000 in terms of consistency after his first year, at least he was above 41 wins for the entirety. They fired him after a 43 win season in 2007, 2008. Like it's bad. It's embarrassing. It's so not good. And to say like, Oh, this is, you know, this is part of the process. We can learn from this. Then what was last year? I think what you need to learn is, if you're this organization, that what you have is not good enough, which gets us to some of what Bradley Beal said today. And a question about Bradley Beal that I would like to ask next as well, which is, does anybody actually like Bradley Beal? Moreover, does anyone love Bradley Beal? We'll get into that next. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. All right, it's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. So, talking about the Wizards, talking about Bradley Beal, and Beal had some interesting things to say today. We'll try to play that for you in the next segment. Anthony, I know that Neil had it, uh, some of the audio from from Brad. Uh, and Neil, Neil is in Neil DeLal, who will join us at 6 o'clock from Hoop District later on in the show. Um Beal was super interesting because he basically was like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm frustrated. Like I'm, I'm mad. I don't like this, you know, but I'm not the decision maker. I'm not Tommy Shepard. I'm not Wes Unseld. Actually his quote was, I'm not Tommy Shepard. I'm not Ted Leonsis, which feels like the most antagonistic thing that Bradley Beal has done towards this organization in his entire time here. Um, He has always been, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that. And now, all of a sudden, because he's the guy with the contract and the no-trade clause, he's like, well, not me. And then he got a little testy uh, with some media, uh, or not necessarily with some of the media, but, like, just in general towards the media, saying, well, you know, y'all are trying to run me out of town. And what I would tell Brad is this. Trying to run you out of town for your own good, bro. Because <laughs> there's a dead end here. Unfortunately, the reality seems to be that if you are here under your contract, this team cannot win a championship. Nevertheless, or they can't even like forget championship. They can't they can't make 
right now they couldn't even make the playoffs. Nevertheless, a conference final or, or again, that higher goal of, of ultimately winning the whole thing. But getting to the second round of the playoffs like shouldn't be unfeasible before the season even starts. And that's unfortunate, unless you are trying to do that, because you are trying to get there and beyond in the future. And I think it's worth repeating that the Wizards' stated goal this year was to make the playoffs, was to win playoff games, was to be competitive in the Eastern Conference, even if they knew in their heart of hearts and would tell you as much that they knew they weren't ready to compete for a championship. Like, they were they are big time, hey, we are in the middle of this process. Now, again, that's a harder sell when you're going into year three of a head coach and was this, year four, year five of a front office change, uh, you know, when you go from Grunfeld to Tommy Shepard. It's also even harder for Tommy, who's been here since, what, 2003, I think? It's like, hey, man, you've kind of been a big deal for a lot of that, assistant GM for a long time, and then ultimately the guy in charge. But we all know that this is, in a lot of ways, ownership-driven. That this is because the owner, Ted Leontis, refuses, refuses to allow any kind of tanking, any kind of franchise management, we'll call it. And he also wants to, like, he is loyal to a fault. That phrase has never fit anybody more perfectly than it does Ted Leonsis. He is someone who, once he locks in on, hey, you're my guy, he's going to try to keep that person as long as possible. And I've said this a million times before, that is admirable as a human being. It is bad for business management and professional sports. Sure, it helps you make sure that you keep Alex Ovechkin, but if, if the guy that you're keeping is not Alex Ovechkin, one of the five best players in the history of the sport, that's a bad formula. And teams who are willing to be more, or I would say not more, they're teams that would be willing to be less loyal, teams that are willing to be more business-minded, they are going to be more successful in the long run. The Sixers' competitive run started with them kicking Andre Iguodala out of town. Unless you get lucky like Milwaukee with Giannis, you're, you're kind of that's the way you're going to have to do it. You know, the, the Celtics kicking Paul Pierce out and being like, hey, man, time to go. We're going we're gonna to go in a different direction and ultimately trading him to Brooklyn. That's way harder than if the Wizards had to trade Bradley Beal. In terms of the fan base, in terms of what he means to the team, Beal to the Wizards, he's been a very, very good player and a good soldier for a long time. He's one of the best players in franchise history. That, all due respect to Brad, says a lot more about the Wizards franchise history than it does him. But, like, I think in most franchises, Brad would be a one of the 10, to, like, in the Lakers franchise or the Celtics, maybe not. But most, most franchises, Brad would be a top 5 to 10 all-time player. And he's certainly that here. So, for Pierce, like, he won a title there. He's the best player for a decade and a half there. He like defines an era of Celtics basketball, which was very successful and obviously culminates with Garnett coming in and Ray Allen coming in and then winning a championship. But they make multiple finals. And Pierce and Antoine Walker were more successful than anything Brad has done here. And again, I'm not trying to dump on Brad. I'm just saying, like, there are organizations that are very successful that take alternate strategies. And I think the the that has created something for Brad that is kind of unfortunate because all he's done is play pretty well for a very long time. And are there certainly areas of criticism? And by the way, he's played very well for a long time and then taken contracts offered to him. Like, obviously he's going to do that. But what that's created is this expectation on him to be great. When you sign the 35% max, basically a super max, you're expected to play at super max levels. And unfortunately for Brad and for Dame Lillard and for a lot of other guys who have signed those, Russ, 
there ain't that many dudes who, who are worth that. But teams keep giving it to them. And thus, there's disappointment and trades and, you know, all these things. And that leads to this question that I actually want to ask on the phones. 301-230-0980. And it stemmed from a tweet that I got earlier um, from someone, do it, from, from Raven Wizard, who has his little name on Twitter right now is Sell the Wizards Ted Leonsis. So uh, I think we know, know where he sits on all this because... In my lifetime, I honestly don't recall a fan base disliking a star player more than Beal. And I actually, I don't agree with that. And Anthony, you actually had a tremendous one when we were, uh, we were talking before the show. Um, who, was, who was yours that you put in the text? I said, uh, it's Bradley Beal, the Albert Hainsworth. Of the Washington Wizards. Yeah, he's he's definitely not. Um, that is that is one thousand percent not the uh not not the uh what's it called? That's not the comparison. Because he's so much better than Albert Hainsworth ever was here. Like Hainsworth was a complete and total bust here, couldn't pass a conditioning test. Yeah. Brad's not that. I'm thinking more so from a monetary standpoint. Sure, not worth the contract, but, like, Hainsworth wasn't worth a vet minimum here. Brad's Brad's worth a pretty penny. I think coming – Albert Hainsworth, you know, coming out of Tennessee, multiple Pro Bowls. I want to say he was an all-pro. It seemed as though, like, he was, you know, due for that money or, you know, he was worth it. And yeah, but there, there was a lot of questions. Get... There was a lot of questions about him and like like no one else was giving him the contract that he got here. Yeah. And in a way that's true for Beal, but it's also like you know, most teams in the NBA would have if Bradley Beal was their player would have done the same exact thing the Wizards did. Teams do I mean, look, the Warriors just paid Jordan Poole a max deal. It's not a super max, but like a max deal. And uh that looks pretty terrible right now. Poole did not have a good year. And they're the Warriors. The Warriors are also the same team that drafted James Wiseman. Mm -hmm. That bomb. Not good. Got rid of him. Got rid of him. Um, So, like, teams, good teams, good GMs make mistakes. Um, But I think think the question that I have more than, like, a dislike, because, like, people hated Hainsworth because he dogged it and it was terrible, right? But for Beal, like, normally, uh, our guy Toby, who used to work up in Milwaukee, works with us now here. He does updates on the fan. He fills in as a producer over here on 980. Um, Great dude, good host. Uh, He used to work in Milwaukee. And he's like, for what it's worth, there's a ton of Packers fans who hate Aaron Rodgers. And it's like for the off-field drama and all that kind of stuff. And that, like, was clarifying for me. Because it's not about, like, a dislike, right? It's Is there anybody that actually loves Bradley Beal? Right? Because, f- yes, there are Packers fans. And, like, let's even rewind it a couple years ago before Aaron Rodgers was, like, this drama, like, full drama, very little, or not nearly as much substance, uh, Aaron Rodgers. Right? And he's on the way to another team. And people were willing to tolerate the shenanigans because he was the back-to-back MVP of the league. And people loved him. Like, there's 12 jerseys everywhere. Does anybody love Bradley Beal? Like, how many... The percentage of, of people who are like, oh, it, my favorite player is Bradley Beal. It, it, is it one of the smallest of any star player in the league? It's got to be the smallest of star players who have been in the same place for 10 years. And I think it's part, like, Brad has missed a lot of games. It's part style, where, like, Brad is not nearly as exciting as a Steph Curry in terms of just pizzazz. So, like, the kid, the kid bracket... But amongst, like, season ticket holder basketball fans, you know, b- adult basketball fans in D.C., like, I just think they look at the contract, and they're like, that dude ain't worth that. And it, and it sucks for Brad. I would hate, like, I would love to have his problems. Let's be very, very clear, <laughs> right? I would love to have, oh, my God, I'm just paid so much money, and I'm very good at basketball, but people think I should be better or not make as much money. But 
it does kind of suck for him if that that like a lot of this is stuff. Like, what was he supposed to do? Turn the money down? Oh, no, not not at all. Right. And so this this is the conundrum. This is the thing I just I don't know what to do with with Brad, which is why I very rarely put any of the 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 heat on Brad. This microphone does not receive a lot of flack for Bradley Beal. Now, he said something today that caught my ear in terms of I should have taken better care of my body. Um, I would I want to flush that out a little bit, and perhaps we can get some of that sound later in the show. Um, but like this is this is just bad management. It's a bad understanding of who your guys are, and that that to me like goes back to the Ted level stuff. Like we can talk about Tommy with the draft stuff and some of the players that he's kept and signed and whatever. We can talk about Wes maybe not getting the most out of players in certain situations. But at the end of the day, like it comes down to this. Ted Leonsis values guys that wear Wizards jerseys more than the rest of the league does and is willing to give them amounts of money that they they should not be getting, not because they're not great basketball players uh, within certain levels, but because you have a salary cap, there are market values, and just you're not going to build a winning team by giving them that money. That's That is the the boiled down version of the Wizards problem. So it, it does lead to this weird thing with Beal, and that's my question. 301-230-0980. Like, who actually loves Bradley Beal? Are there any, like, diehard Beal is my guy fans? If that's you or you got a buddy, whatever, call us. 301-230-0980. We'll take those calls next here on The Hoffman Show. You can listen to the team night. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980, always live as well on the free Odyssey app. And as of, well, last week, but we're back at it today, we are streaming live as well. YouTube.com slash at the Team 980. You get to see Anthony's shoulder shimmies. Sometimes you get some eyebrow dancing too. We got some of that there. Uh, All right, so... Before we get to the calls, 301-230-0980. Here's the back and forth between Neil DeLal, uh, who will join us later. Actually, I don't know if it was Neil's back and forth, but uh, credit to Hoops District for for capturing this audio. Um, here's here's uh, Beal responding to a question about kind of where he's at and, and the general direction of the franchise and his role in it. I'm at peace with how the year went. I'm not at okay. peace with how we are as a team. Okay, so that was that's going to be the question. Yeah. What's your patience level as you? It's low, for sure. Yeah, I have a low patience level. That's why I'm like, it's it's not like I'm not angry. I'm definitely, I'm definitely disappointed, but I'm not going to sit up here and show that. Like, I'm frustrated. I'm angry, but I express that to the necessary voices and people who, who need to hear it for sure. Right. So my question for for Brad would be, and we'll get more from Neil and kind of about this back and forth and where it went later. Uh, and obviously, we're we're also efforting like the full audio from not only Brad but from Tommy and Wes. Uh, is like, whoa! Oh, I'm mad. Okay, cool. Like, what are you gonna do about it? You mean you're gonna get your butt in the gym and and insert training montage here? Um, is it mean? Hey, man. Like, I know you really want to re-sign Kuz, and I like Kyle a lot, but, like, we can't do that. We need to flip him, or we need to trade Kristaps. We need to do this. We need to do that. Like, I don't know what that means. Like, yeah. You want to know who else is angry? All the fans. You want to know who has no input on it? All the fans. What does that anger translate to, and what are you angry about? Because I can tell you, like, you're angry that, obviously, you won 35 games, but... What factors that contributed to that are you angry about would be my question. And Brad admitted some of that, I think, is anger at himself, and I'll give him this credit, the the self-awareness to say this. some of this is on me because I got to take care of my body better and I got to be more available. Uh, Matt Paris followed up on that. He said that some of that was related to the wrist injury, that that messed up kind of the off-season workouts. And that's legitimate on some level. Like, you get work in in the offseason. You just can't replicate in training camp in the preseason. That said, they sh- they clearly messed up that process if he missed the time that he did. You can't have a guy going in and out the way Brad did with the hamstrings this year. Like, that was – that means they messed, they messed up and then, then didn't take the time to correct it. Um, 
which I think they said during the season too, like when he re-injured it quickly that one time, like that was that was not good. But it does lead to this question, right? Like the the frustration, you know, the media is trying to run me out of town. Uh, like for a star player, the dislike of Beal because it's not it's not a bunch of media folks who are just like this guy sucks, get him out of town. I actually think the media typically gets the Brad thing right. He's very very good. He's not good enough to be the best player on a championship team, and the team around him isn't good enough. Uh, to win a championship or compete at a high level because there's no one better than him. Or at least uh, if they are, it's only marginally. And the types of players that are surrounded uh, are, are not the right fits around him. Like, you don't have really good defensive players around him. That is a problem. Uh, you can't have the Kuzmas and the Porzingises and the Beals of the world all on the same team because that's too much money invested in not enough defense. So that creates this somewhat combative but just realistic uh, disconnect between like finances talent and success that causes fans to not really like it very much so uh let's go to the phones 301-230-0980 anybody actually like love Beal anyone like you know no actually that's my guy Hoffman you got it you got it all wrong you got it twisted let's go to Little get us started Little thanks for calling you're on the team 980 yeah, thank you for taking my call, Hoff, and uh, my main man, Anthony. Look, look, Glenn Carlson, that's 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 Bradley Bill, man. Glenn Carlson, let me explain something to you, Hoff. You you play a little ball, I heard, and then and then I, then I know Anthony play. I play. I'm a football man. I play basketball. But let me let me use this situation as a parable. When Dinwiddie was a point guard, Bradley was a, Bradley was a hell of a ball player coming off of picks. It's how the coach got to coach him. Only time a pure shooter. He either had the ball in his hand after he had drained three, four, five shots. That's when you bring the ball up court. They had Bradley Bill bring the ball up court a lot, man. He's a turnover machine right now. What he did improving is his three-point shooting. I'm a football man at Hoffman. Come on, now. You're you going hard on the young blood. The young the boy's a poor, poor shooter and an athlete, but it's the way you use him. When he come off of picks and then he busts a couple of shots, that's when he – only time you need the ball in his hand is the last shot of the game when the clock running out. After he didn't, after he didn't got his shot on, after he didn't got hot. Come on, man. We seen Bradley averaging thirty some of the game when he had a hell of a point guard running them all for picks. It's how the coach is used. What I would hope Arcel would do is go back and look at some film. Well, so here, little, little, I hear you, but like that's not actually hey, look, a man, West. I, I, I go to a lot of Wizards games. I'm at the game a lot. Me and Glenn Carlson, we close. I'm at a lot of games. I'm telling you now, it's how the coaches got to use. I would like for him to sit down, look at some fit. Man, Brad was having 30 something game with did when he was a point guard, man. No, no, he wasn't. I knew that one just, situation that was terrible. He was 30, but all right, thanks. He was he averaged 30 a game when Russ was here, um, the 2021 season. He averaged 30 a game in 1920. Um, he had some 30 point games when Spencer was here at the beginning of last year, but ultimately Beal averaged 23.2 points per game last year, and that trade didn't happen until February. And he shot the worst he had in a long time. The problem is that with you saying it's the coaches not using him right, it's the organization. I actually agree in large part with your point. I don't like Beal having the ball in his hands as much as he is right now. But let's get some statistics straight before we, you know, dice that out. Beal, from a turnover standpoint, is had one of his better years considering his usage. Like, he was 2.9 turnovers a game. Last year, the year Dinwiddie was here, he averaged 3.4. The year before, the year that Westbrook was here, he averaged 3.1. And then 19.20, he averaged 3.4. The years before that, he was 2.7, 2.6, 2.0, 2.0. Obviously a younger player, fewer minutes, fewer, you know, ball, not in his hands quite as much, et cetera. From a shooting percentage, like last year was his worst three-point season of his career by a mile. He has only shot 30% from three. Um, this year, he dialed back the attempts, lower number since or lowest number since 2015, 2016, but he shot 36.5%, and he was super efficient from the field overall. He shot over 50% from the field in the first time of his career. His effective field goal percentage which weights twos and threes was the highest since 2016, 2017. Like Brad scoring the ball had a very efficient year, 
What I agree with Whittle with that I can't stand that they do is not using him more as an off-ball creator. In his, what I think were his best years, and, and really it's about, hey, how did the team do? How do you, how was he best used to affect winning? Well, one, when he was younger player in 16, 17, 17, 18, uh, and even to an extent, 18, 19, uh, he was shooting seven, six and a half, seven threes a game. Right? Last time they finished over 500, he's shooting six and a half threes a game. Average 22 points. All good. This year, he averaged 4.4. For a guy of his shooting ability, that's not enough. And by the way, the other problem is he doesn't get to the free throw line enough. You can't be both shooting 4.4 threes a game and only 4.6 free throw attempts. It's one thing when you're shooting six and a half or seven threes a game getting five free throws a game. But if you're going to be a premier scorer in this league, like you got to get to the free throw line more. Beal averaged uh, eight free throw attempts a game, for instance, the first year he averaged 30 and 7.7 in the second year. So, like, I agree with the point that they need to get him in more off-ball situations, and I thought that was going to be happening more with Monte Morris, but it is clear from what the front office wants, because Tommy talks about this a lot, they want Brad on the ball. And again, like, this is a problem. If you want to make him a glorified point guard that averages 23 points, five assists, and, you know, shoots four and a half threes a game, whatever, that's fine. You need a two guard, like, then you need to play him as a point guard. You need a two guard that's a higher volume shooter, maybe even Kispert, but you you need that with exceptional defenders. So let's say you are going to go Kispert, who shot, what, I think he ended at 43% from the year on three. Okay, well then, your power forward can't be Kristaps Porzingis, and your small forward can't be Kyle Kuzma, or your center and power forward, however you want to play that. You need better defenders. There's, And this is the problem. The roster around him is not constructed in a way that makes any sense with, with a combination of players. Because then if you want to say, okay, well, DeLon Wright's going to play point guard, so you have a better defender next to Beal, well, now I need him in more as a shooter. Now I need DeLon to run the offense, because otherwise, what's he doing? Standing there, waiting in the corner, not really that much of a threat. Like, he's he's developed into a fine three-point shooter, but he's not. he doesn't have the gravity of a guy like Kispert that draws defenses out. So, like, I agree, actually, with a lot of Little's point. I would just not put the blame on... Wes entirely because this is an organizational decision to put the ball in Bradley Beal's hands. It just is. Them's the facts. Uh, we got a couple more calls. Uh, Vaughn, Steve, hang tight. We'll get to you next. Uh, does anybody actually love Bradley Beal? Am I missing something here? Uh, not, again, trying to be mean to Brad. It's just kind of the, the, the oddity of the situation that they've created here in D.C., 301-230-0980, the phone number. First, let's tell you, though, what's trending. It's the Hoffman Show on the Team 980. We are always live on the free Odyssey app. Eric Flack, WUSA 9, joins us coming up here in just a few minutes. He is uh, on top of the latest when it comes to the um, the lawsuit that was settled today between the commanders and and the District of Columbia, so we'll get Flack in here in a couple minutes. All right, let's get into some more calls, though. Does anybody actually love Bradley Beal? Am I missing that? Has, has kind of the whole situation here, the way it's it's not worked out, the contract, everything, like, yeah, he's a star. Yeah, he's a good player. Um, and a lot of people like him. Does anybody – does he does he have the love in, is in the same way that other stars do? It just doesn't seem that way. Let's go to Vaughn and Alexandria. Vaughn, thanks for holding. You are on the Hoffman Show. Hey, hey Craig. Uh, to answer your question, I think fans are so frustrated. If, if the reporter, when Brad made the response, um, you guys seem like you want me out, if you would have heard the fans, I think 99% would have been like, yeah, we want you out. Right. And that's, it's not really Brad's fault. It's I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to disagree with your point. You said it's not West's fault. I'm going to tell you why it's, it is his fault. Uh, remember around when they had this streak about three-fourths through the season and they came 
uh, on the radio shows and said we're about middle of the pack offensively. We're about middle of the pack defensively. We're playing well. <clears throat> this is when they they were going good for a while there, right? Everything was working out. You had a lot of po- positive conversation from the organization. Okay, tell me this. We finished with 35 wins. I'm going to tell you why exactly is West's fault. Chris Porzingis scores majority of his points in the first half. We struggled in the fourth quarter. I'm going to tell you, all our issues are in the fourth quarter. Brad turns the ball over in late possessions, how we typically lose the game. Denny is a, a young, fast, athletic guy. Why are we not getting as many fast break points? Uh, Kuz, we have no identity offensively. That's my frustration with West, and I mean, it points directly to West. His substitution patterns are hor- horrible. Um, if you look at, okay, you say, what are we good at? What are we bad at? Those are the questions directly that lay, lays, lays on uh, West. Why are we not doing some of the things we've done early in the game <clears throat> that we had success at the end of the game? Okay, we, we get into the Because the players aren't the very good. Tell- yeah, but you can't say middle through the season that we're, we're top – 15 offensively, defensively with them same players. It make, that, that makes zero sense. When were they top 15 defensively? L- go back and listen to Tommy and West when they had this streak two-thirds through the season. They said we were efficiency, yeah, top they had, offense, they top, had a, top 15. They had a stretch where they had a top, top 15. In the top 15. Right, but like the the idea of being good involves – longevity you can't you can't have a 10 game stretch where you win you play a bunch of bad teams and produce and be like see this is who we are no who you are is, is over this the course is, of 82 this games is coming from the organization though craig yeah it's but coming what, from the organization okay well we have to i mean literally my job as a journalist as a media person especially as an opinion journalist is to take what they say and be like that's right that's wrong that's right that's wrong this is my opinion on why or here's in this particular case data to say that they are wrong like that they are full of it so or contextualized. I agree with you. So I agree. So when we call, like I watch every game, I call Glenn and uh, get, guess the guy that's with Glenn on the post game show is a guy named Brad. You his know, name's, I told him about Brian, my issues sure. with Brad. Brian. You know, he blamed the fans. Well, this is Brad's best season. How can you blame Brad? Well, the that's fans the thing. Got though, it wrong. Like, the fans don't know what they're talking about. All right, Vaughn. Thanks. Thanks for the call. Th- this is my point. If Brad's best season leads to 35 wins, what's the freaking point? Like, someone has to shoot. There, oh, I wish I favorited this tweet. There was an incredible tweet that chronicled yesterday in the NBA. Like, there's the kid from Memphis who I never heard of who scored 42 points. You had a bunch of random dude, like two guys. A Peyton Pritchard yesterday had a 30-point triple-double for Boston. If in a playoff game against the best teams and the, the best players, Boston put the ball in Peyton Pritchard's hands enough that he could get a 30-point triple-double, they would get their ass kicked. It's about efficiency. It's about what you do on the other end of the floor with the minutes. Like, these guys are great. These are the best 450 basketball players on the planet. If you give them opportunities over the course of a roughly 100-point or possession game, someone's got to score. And when you are Bradley Beal or Kristaps Porzingis or Kyle Kuzma, you get a lot of opportunities. Your usage rate is fairly high, and you're very good. So you're going to score. The question is, does it ultimately result in wins? And the answer is no. And this is my problem with Tommy's thing. Where Tommy's like, yesterday with Wes Hall on uh, the pregame show, he's like, you know, we're incomplete. If we had just got, you know, we we had been a little healthier, then maybe it would have been different. Here's the real stats. I don't make these up. I just give them to you. You tell me whether this is good or not. The Washington Wizards in 2022-2023, in the 35 games that Bradley Beal, Kyle Kuzma, and Kristaps Porzingis played together, were 16-19. and I'm going to do that math real quick. So hold on. This is terrible radio, but sometimes this is, this is the way we got to do it. All right, so they, what did I say? They're 16 and 19, so they won 16 of 35 games. That is a 45% winning percentage. I'm, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to multiply that times 82 games. 
Let's see what the number is. 37.4. So if you extrapolate their winning percentage with Kuzma and Beal over the or Kuzma, sorry, Kuzma, Beal, and Porzingis over an 82 game season, they go from a 35 win team to a 37 win team. And you want to run that back? Now, I'm not saying it's a direct translation. I will give Shepard and Wes and everybody else over there this. If they had gotten more time and more continuity, perhaps they figure some of the things out. Someone earlier criticized Wes's substitution patterns. I hate that criticism because he had different guys literally it felt like every night. What's a rotation when you're just trying to figure out who's available? And so the idea that this is working, that you can take a big three that has a net rating of plus 3.3, a.k.a. when those three are on the floor together, They are only outscoring their opponents on the entire season by 3.3 points per 100 possessions. That, to me, says the buck stops with the roster. That doesn't mean West couldn't be better. It doesn't mean you couldn't get more out of players. It doesn't mean that substitution patterns couldn't have been better at times. All of those things. It doesn't mean, like Don tweeted in, that West doesn't necessarily need help. First job with the challenges he's had, he needs at least a lead assistant who has been through the wars to help him figure this out. I wouldn't mind adding to the coaching staff a guy like Steven Silas who just got let go in Houston. Sure, fine, all of that. But the basis of the problems are that the roster is not good enough and that the stars who are supposed to carry the load are not, not, not good players. They are fantastic individual basketball players. But the collection of them, even playing well, Arguably, your three best players have career years, and you won 35 games. I just don't know how you argue with that. Uh, Steve has been waiting on hold forever. Steve, I'm going to get you in real quick before we go to break. Uh, Go ahead. You're on the Hoffman Show. Hey, how you doing? Um, Let let me just say this. Um, I don't think that Tommy – well, Tommy Shepard, Wes Unsell Jr., I don't think they're on the same page. I don't think they have the same philosophy. Wes Unsell Jr. was supposed to be a defensive specialist. Okay, that's the first thing. This team doesn't play defense. They don't rebound well. They don't block shots well. And as far as your question about Bradley Beal, um, I don't think I don't love him as a player. Um, I never did. I think he's a good player. Right. But I think there's something with him. He didn't get along supposedly with John Wall. He didn't get along with Dinwiddie. Um, the be- I think he played his best when he was with uh, Russell Westbrook. So he- he's not – he shouldn't have the ball as much as they want him to. I agree with you there. But the roster construction is way off. It doesn't make any sense to me. And Tommy Shepard, to me, is like a – he's just like Ernie Gun- Grunfeld. I mean, he was with him for so long. He does have probably his own kind of thoughts, but it seems like I'm, I'm seeing Ernie Jr., yeah. And as long as they continue down this path, I, I just don't think they're going to get any better. They might have an early draft pick. I don't trust Tommy Shepard picking um, anybody. Well, that's he, that's been the uh, problem, whatever. too. That, Steve, Steve yeah, I appreciate Johnny the call. Davis Thanks, made. man. Thanks. Uh, sorry, we're up against the break. I hate to cut you off because um, it sounds like you had many good thoughts. I will say this. Ernie and Tommy are different. They have the same owner. That is the overriding similarity between them because the owner is the one that dictates the Beal contract. Is what it is. Give it the old. Uh, what's that? What was the the guy's name in um, Michael Jordan's like security guy in in Last Dance? Remember that guy, the meme? Yeah, uh, that, I can't think dude, of his name. I don't remember his name, but like that's the meme that we need right now. Um, that's the biggest similarity. Is like they both got like okay, this is your guy. We got to build around it. And by the way, we are always trying to make the playoffs no matter what, and so we chase instead of thinking long term. Um, but I agree. Like the roster construction is not meant to maximize Beal. It's not good. It doesn't mean that the players aren't good. Um, and I will say this. I will end on a positive note as we're way over on the clock. Uh, whoops. Uh, Eric Flack uh, is going to join us here in just a moment. But the drafting thing is a huge issue. They've obviously missed a ton. Perhaps the most positive thing of the last two weeks of the Wizards' seasons. I think Johnny Davis is going to be a good NBA player. 
Like, it is completely, I've turned on him. I see it. I see what they see. He sees the game very well. Go to summer league, play well in like two or three games, then go on with the rest of your summer vacation. Johnny, like, if you want to next year start Brad at point guard and have Johnny Davis as your two guard and he's like an athletic cutting guy who also is a three and D guy, now we're talking about something potentially. They obviously need Avia to make a huge jump, Kispert to make a big jump. Uh, and and then I would still do other things with the rest of the roster, but I don't think Davis is going to be the bust that everyone thought he was going to be, and I actually think he might turn out to be pretty freaking good. So that's nice. Uh, when we get back, Eric Flack has the latest on the lawsuit settlement between the city, uh, the District of Columbia, and the Washington Commanders for Not My Beat here on the Team 980. 